Forward Guidance is brought to you by Van Eck, a global leader in asset management since 1955. You'll be hearing more about a Van Eck ETF later on, but for now, let's get into today's interview. What a day in markets. Investors globally were shocked uh, by a huge, huge sell-off in the market. Uh, the S&P down as much as 4.4, 4.5% uh, at the beginning of the day. Uh, things are looking a little bit better now. The Japanese market down 12%, the biggest loss since 1987. Uh, I've even heard that the Taiwanese market is down the most uh, intraday since 1967. Uh, so things are looking uh, a little bit bleak. Uh, again, we're getting a, a little bit of a rebound, but uh, the VIX, the volatility index on the S&P 500, uh, went as high as 64, 65 to be honest, I was uh, on vacation today and I was not planning uh, at talking really to, to anyone. We've uh, recorded interviews that are, you know, are going to air while I'm on vacation, but the volatility was so extreme. You know, what choice did we have? So I'm really pleased that uh, at the last minute we were able to speak to volatility expert Noel Smith, uh, who has been on this show before. Noel, as the screens behind him would suggest, is an expert at trading volatility, and he's extremely busy today. Today is like the Super Bowl uh, for him and other volatility experts, so we're, we're grateful he can spare the time. Noel, great to see you again. Uh, start off, what, what are your thoughts? How much of this do you think is overall macro? Uh, there was a recession fear, a bad jobs report on Friday. Uh, there's a yen carry trade unwind. A lot of people are pretending to know what caused the sell-off. Of course, no one really knows. But how much of it was exogenous to the volatility space? And how much of it do you think is coming, you know, the call is coming from within the house, your world of people were short volatility, volatility spikes, and they are forced to cover. And there's kind of a, a margin call on, on volatility. You know, whenever we do this stuff, we go into the realm of speculation. Nobody knows. You said that already. So that's definitely accurate. So the Chicago pit trader and me will just kind of get straight to the point. Uh, I feel like it's forced unwind. You know, if you have these lever trades, specifically like a Yen carry trade or something like that, what's happening is you're getting leverage on all sides of that trade. And if you need to undo it, you have to unlever swiftly on all sides of that trade. If you look at the bid offer differential and vol products today, um, it's so wide so as to make it virtually untradeable, at least at anything close to what you would think is a good price, unless you're a market maker, in which case it's a great price for you. Um, so it's, it's my feeling, and I've talked to a handful of people today, the answer I get from everybody is nobody knows, but like most things, we you know, with COVID or the global financial crisis or whatever else, it's never just that one thing, right? It's the confluence of, you know, balls going up, the, the Asian markets are getting wrecked. Um, there's idea of a force on wine, there's re recessionary fears. You know, we went from a few rate cuts priced into like, you know, as many as 10 rate cuts into the middle of the next year this morning, and that's already kind of ebbed and flowed. So I don't ever think that it's one thing. I think it's uh, the confluence of a lot of things. And, you know, we're really busy. Like that screen over there, that's just my fills today. And there's thousands of them. Wow. So that is, that is not a prop behind you. <laughs> no, no, it's not. Uh, so I, the, the VIX, which is the implied volatility of, of the S&P 500, uh, I saw it this morning traded as high as 64 or 65. Now, just put that into context. Uh, I, I learned from you and other volatility experts that I think a VIX of 16 implies roughly a 1% move on the S&P a day. So let's see, 64 divided by 16. I'm not very good at math, but that's uh, over four. Does that imply that every single day the VIX expects or is pricing in the S&P to move up 4% a day, which you know, needless to say is is crisis level 2008 2020 uh, uh levels although maybe a little bit less so so i'll cut i'll cut this short because it's pretty just wonky but it's what it is it's an annual it's an annualized figure on the standard deviation of the moves within the spx okay so that is technically true what you're saying that uh, vix of 64 is saying that we're going to get a four percent move per day roughly um you know for the next year in that band but reality what happens is, is like things get shocked up they get super wide and then you know they trade so I don't think anybody thinks we're going to move 4% per day for the next year over the next, you know, 30 days. More accurately, what I think it is, is that people are coming in, they have to cover these positions, they have to get out, and the market just gets shocked to where the market makers can't lose money. So, you know, if you're in the business of, of you know, of buying BMWs, and someone's like, I've got 50,000 BMWs to sell you today, and you think that they're worth 50 grand, well, you're like, I'll pay 20. 
you know, you give some number where you're like, I'll just take them all. I don't, there's no way I can lose. Or your risk is such that you already have a lot of BMWs on your lot. You don't even really need it anymore. I'll pay two grand, you know, for a, a BMW that's worth 40, 50 grand. And just the numbers get absurd because the people that are making you those markets have the luxury of making them absurd. If you look at like CBOE stock today, it's up. At least it was when I looked at it last. And market making operations like, you know, Susquehanna, Optiver, IMC, Citadel Securities, Virtu, um, less Virtu. But, you know, they should be doing very, very, very well today. And so uh, people are tr trading uh, options, mostly uh, puts, I should say. So uh, puts are more expensive when things move more and the, the, the same with the calls. And the VIX is just a measure of that implied volatility over the 30 days. It's a little more complicated than that. How uh, how come, could could you short the VIX at, at 65? And, you know, uh, you, is it fair to say that you can't actually trade what you see as the spot VIX? And you can only trade futures on the VIX. And based on what I said, the, the futures on the August VIX were much lower than 65. I think, uh, you know, maybe even lower than 40. Um, why? So if, if someone wanted to short volatility at 65, where how would they do that? Would they short 30-day options? Like, how? where is this magical spot VIX that no one can actually trade? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's, that's let's talk about what's, what's tradable and, like, why do, why do you want to talk to people like me? It's not tradable. You can't do that. And even if you could do it, would you want to? So VIX is not tradable, but you can trade VIX futures or VIX options. Okay. Those two things are, are real. But the VIX, and the VIX options are, uh, the, the, the um, they're based off of the VIX futures. Correct. So the August VIX future, as I speak, is trading 28.57. A lot lower than 65, isn't it? Yes. So, and, and if you want to trade just that VIX future, you have to, you know, collateralize it, right? If you're just going to trade it naked or you have to spread it. And then that spread because the way the, the VIX futures work, you know, VIX August will get bid, September less so, and then it goes down, 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 down from there to the point where you see the uh, fall futures are trading in the you know mid twenties or whatever. And if you want to go into the options, which is typically what I traffic in because I like knowing a defined risk. I almost never have anything like a basis trade on, which is like one month future versus another month future, mm -hmm. because those things can get so sideways so fast. And there's nothing you can do about it. But going more to the point, if you look at the VIX puts, which is to say you see VIX at 65, your idea is that it's going to go lower than 65. What do I do? Well, you can buy something like SVIX. You can sell something like VXX if you can get borrowed, but you probably can't. Yeah. And then you can trade the options on those same things, which is to say vol goes down, VXX goes down, SVIX goes up, or VIX goes down, VIX futures go down. So how do you trade that? Well, what you do is probably want to buy puts. But you look at the puts and they're trading at like 160 vol. So VIX could get cut in half and you still are not up money on that trade. It's a very difficult trade to get off at a favorable price. And not only are the prices not favorable, but the marketplace is so wide. So if you try to trade a spread, in other words, the at the money puts and VIX futures, it's going to the at the money option will be something like 160 vol. But the, um, you know, 20 percent out of the money put will be something like 80 vol. So now you, if you want to buy a 10 wide, $10 wide put spread in VIX, V-I-X options, mm. you got to pay like six bucks for it. So you got to pay six to make four, not that great of a trade. Uh, right. And when you say it has a vol of 160, you're talking about the volatility of the VIX. So volatility of volatility. And there you're oh, talking about the, to the downside. So what's the volatility of if the VIX you know, goes from... 20 to 40, how much can I get paid from it, it going down? And then there's uh, selling call spreads. So by the way, I should say, you said, if you can't get borrow, so there are VIX, uh, ETFs, ETPs, exchange traded products and, and funds, and that are long volatility and short volatility. And these things over time are, are guarantee, almost guaranteed over time to lose money. So for example, if in 2011, you sold short uh, one share of uh, uh, UVXY, it would be worth, at the time, it would have been worth $88 billion. Uh, so that's a pretty good sharp ratio. The thing is that these things spike at the, the worst possible time, such as now. So for example, UVXY is up uh, 146% uh, from its bottom in the middle of July. And from, uh, from last Fed day, it's up 110%. So if you're short this thing, you, know, you, you go more than bankrupt. Um, Unless you you know risk manage it as it, but that itself has a cost. Uh, so and you said today 
is most of the time, can you get a borrow? I, you can short sell these ETFs and ETPs because I'll be honest, I tried to short sell it today, but I couldn't get a borrow. Is, is that normal that you can't short sell? And by the way, like no one should attempt to do this un unless they're aware of just how risky it is. And you know, this is very, uh, um, very bad convexity because th these things can go up. Um, but so, you know, this is a very dangerous trade. However, uh, is it normal that you can't short sell things when, when things go crazy like this? It's normal. And not only if you can get borrow, your borrow may be taken away from you at the worst possible time. And you might even get bought in, which is to say, if you had short shares, say you were short, you know, 500,000 shares of a 5,000 shares of something yeah. um, that you want to go down. And then you wake up the next day and your 5,000 short shares are gone. If you had a hedge against that, now you're exposed to the marketplace just in a probably in a Delta one fashion. Also, another thing that we haven't talked about, I don't think I've ever heard anybody talk about this. Think about the rates that you're getting on your longs versus your shorts, right? So if you have a long interest rate and then you have a short interest rate, there's an interest rate differential. And if you are not getting the same rate as the market makers and you're not because you're not Citadel, that means the vol that you have to trade is worse and different than the vol you see on the screen. So if you see a screen vol at, I don't know, 100 and, and product XYZ, you're like, I'm going to buy 100. But if you want to delta hedge that, you're going to buy 100 vol and then sell stock at that same synthetic 100 vol. But the problem is that it's not really like that because if your rate is different than the market maker's rate, what's happening is your vol will be lower if you're buying it. And then on the other side of it is if you want to sell it, it's going to be even worse for you both ways. So it's a, it's a hard trade to do. Forward Guidance is brought to you by Van Eck. The Van Eck Morningstar Wide Moat ETF, ticker MOAT, has outperformed the S&P 500 for over a decade. How? Moat strives to achieve a simple but challenging task. Buy quality stocks when they're undervalued and sell them when they're overvalued. Visit vanek.com slash moatfg to learn more. That's vanek.com slash moatfg. Now the disclosures. All investing is subject to risk, including the possible loss of money you invest. Visit vanek.com to carefully read a prospectus before investing. The Vanek Morningstar Wide Moat ETF is distributed by Vanek Securities Corporation, a wholly owned subsidiary of Vanek Associates Corporation. Thanks. Let's get back to the interview. Right. And so it's kind of like the forward price for you is going to be down. It's, it's like if you there's a, a very uh, uh, you know low quality, thinly traded stock that you say, oh, this stock is trading at nine dollars. I think it's worth nine cents. Uh, you know, psychically, you could just not put on a position and three years later, you'll be right. And you said, oh, I, I could have made money by shorting it. But actually, you couldn't have because the borrow costs would have been uh, extremely expensive. And the puts would have represented that by having a much higher volatility uh, than the calls. Exactly. It's like buying a straddle before earnings. By the time your earnings actually show up, you've theted the exact amount of money as a function of time as you would have if you just you know, did nothing. I mean, the market makers are the, you know, probably the most clever crew on Wall Street overall, at least they should be. And the idea that you're going to outsmart them with your vol calculations, it's just not that likely. You know, but I would, what I'd like to do is kind of get to the, the point of what I would want to hear if I was listening to this. You know, whenever you're, if you're a floor guy from Chicago, you know, the basic attitude is shut up. Tell me what the trade is. Green mm -hmm. button, red button. Tell me what to trade right now, because other than that, you're boring me. I can just tell you what I've done today. We have bought some Delta One instruments. I can't tell you what I'm, what you should do because I can never and will never tell you what to trade. I'm just telling you what I've done. I have bought some Delta One instruments that benefit from bounce. I have come into today long a bunch of VIX. And so we are getting rid of that. Unfortunately, I got rid of some of my August VIX on Friday. Um, that would have been an absolute grand slam today. But we also have VIX in Nov, Jan, Feb, and March. So we're taking that out of inventory right now. And we've been trading opportunistically. I mean, most of the, the positions I have on today in terms of the number of positions are losers. But the ones that aren't losers are just ripping. And those are making it. We have, we're, we're green today. We have a positive P&L. And it's an artifact of the volatility that we almost always have uh, in, in inventory for us. So from a trading strategy standpoint, I would tell really anybody to mimic what I'm doing because that's why I do it. But is to always inventory some vol because by, when you need it on days like Friday or today, I mean, there's no way you should be buying vol today unless you think it's going to go higher tomorrow, which it might. But man, that's statistically, that is a very difficult bet to make because that is a very out of sample type of thing. You know, you're betting on a 99th percentile uh, outcome, which does happen, but it's just statistically something that's very difficult to bet with. So 
you would bet on fading this rise in volatility. You were long volatility and you're not going to go short volatility, but now you are laying off some of that volatility that has skyrocketed in value. I am selling volatility today. I am opportunistically seeing where I think it's overly bid. Correlation is super high. Um, correlations even going into today, traditional correlations were kind of broken. You have the, the Russell relative to the SPY. That was kind of crazy. You have bonds relative to stocks. That's been crazy for a while. You have bond vol relative to stock vol, which has been crazy for a while. So all kinds of things have been in the 0th percentile or 99th percentile, depending on how you flip it. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm looking to, for things to normalize in that regard. And do I expect to make money you know, today, tomorrow? I, I have no idea any more than anybody else. But I'm using this opportunity uh, today to sell vol net net. For sure. I, I haven't bought any vol unless it's been the other side of a spread. And when you said your long Delta One instruments, that would be something like uh, not volatility, but the, the instruments like S&P 500 or NASDAQ or something like that. Correct. Correct. That's exactly what I mean. Got it. And then what instruments were you long or short where you were making money as volatility has been low? Because you said you're warehousing this, you know, being long volatility, but that has been a losing trade for such a long, long time. And, and you can give us the context of, of this year where sh shorting volatility has been extremely profitable. Uh, number one, you know, how have you been, uh, you know, if you were making money, ma making money as your volatility positions have decreased in value. And then also, uh, just the entire uh, Wall Street, how crowded do you think shorting volatility has, has been this year? And is, is that why we saw such a painful reversal today and on Friday? Because so many folks were uh, uh, short volatility and they just got squeezed. Sure. So how we've done it elementary is we are typically short volatility in a defined risk manner in the front. And we are long volatility in a defined risk manner in the back. So when I say that we are long, no, Jan, Feb, and March, we're still long it. But we didn't get long it, you know, Tuesday. We got long it five Tuesdays ago or 17 Tuesdays ago or whatever. Um, and then we keep that on. But as you pointed out, that is a overall over time a losing trade. How do you pay for those losing trades? Well, you pay for it on the front end because the front end tends to die faster than the back end dies. So the ratio between those two things and how you portion your, your theta decay relative to your vega, that's the trade really. So if you're short something like, you know, going into, you know, June or July or August, if you're short that front month as it starts to just creep down, creep down, creep down, you can over, you can overall net net get paid to own that warehouse inventory of volatility that you have in you know, January, February, March. So if you go out there, like we bought the uh, Nov 3040 call spread in VIX. So the VIX Nov 3040 call spread, we paid 42 cents for that thing on a $20 wide, uh, $10 wide. So you can more than 20 extra money. And what's, what's the most you can lose on that? Well, the most you can lose is all your money. So if that thing goes to zero, not that big of a deal, but if it goes to zero and you're also short the front month stuff, your front month stuff will die at a rate of change faster than that anyway. So if you can have say 12 months in a given year and you are, you have one month of explosive volatility and 11 months of nothingness happening, you can make money on the short end with nothingness by keep shorting that front end. And then you can always have the back end that will, you know, cover your your book or your risk if things like today do happen, which is exactly why we do that trade. And frankly, anybody can do that trade. I'm not reinventing the wheel with that. Anyone can do that trade, but I just say, you know, unless someone uh, is a volatility professional, they're not going to be <laughs> as good as it, ne nearly as you, and maybe not as good as it to, to, to make money. So it's not like, oh, I'm, I'm choosing Apple over Microsoft or I'm you know, this is uh, this is high level stuff. And if someone's never done it before, they can try it. They'll probably lose money, uh, but, you know, they'll get an education, but education costs money. Yeah. And we tend to traffic in always in defined risk stuff. And if we're trying to collect data in the, in the interim periods, we're doing that via ratio put spreads or things like that. And again, it is a way to everyone wants long vol sitting on the shelves, you know, as a helmet. Right. That's just the emotionally obvious part of it. But, you know, that thing isn't free. How do you pay for it? So how we pay for it is by being short on the, on the front end against our long on the back end and you know we lose on trades all the time like i said on friday i took off a bunch of august i wish i didn't you know it went up even more today that was a losing trade um you know but getting along that ball which is funny because that's almost the opposite of what i said we were short a bunch of august and as it started to go up we took off our shorts and actually then flipped net positive on august and then we took off 90 percent of our august on friday i was pleased with that because we made money on friday as well and then um coming into today 
we didn't have any August. Actually, we saw it a little bit of we're long a little bit of August puts. Those are all going to money heaven right now. And then they're waiting for the rest of that VIX complex to pay for it. And we're right, also some, we also launched some steepeners. I've been saying that kind of on, on Twitter um, that I think steepeners are a, a good trade. I think they will continue to be a good trade. So we have that on as well. And then we have some defensive names against that. And, you know, our overall like, you know, market decision trades, those are either in a um, cautionary or risk off posture or they're not on at all um, or they're just not that big. Like we trade dispersion correlation. Um, that trade is still on, but it's it's a it's like at two percent. And I even said that publicly. You know, it's just a really tough location to be long. You know, dispersion correlation when it's in its zeroth percentile. I mean, how much of a pig do you want to be? Could it stay at its zeroth percentile for six months? Sure, I don't know any more than anybody else. But I think that is a very difficult trade location to continue to add risk to in any kind of size. So earlier when you said puts and those puts are going to money heaven, I'm almost positive you meant puts on the VIX because puts on the S&P 500 are very much alive and they're, you know, doing up, doing up real really well. Yeah, correct. Uh, yeah. So when you said dis dispersion correlation, what does that mean? What is in its zeroth percentile and why did you decide to not be such a hog and why would putting on dispersion correlation in this environment be such a hog hog like move? Well, not in this environment. Today is different than yeah. That's what I meant. In, in, two in, weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Okay. So I don't know where you know. So what, let's just talk about it realistically from the or holistically from the onset. What dispersion trading is is you're selling volatility in the index and you're buying volatility in the constituent parts of that same index. So what you're trying to do is take a a neutral stance. What you're doing is you're taking a volatility arb stance. So you're not saying market go up, market go down. You're saying you know, vol over here is too high, vol over here is too low, and we're going to try to make money on that differential. That's what that trade is. So in terms of how did we time it, um, we took it off too early. So we took it off, I don't know, maybe um, a month and a half, two months ago. I'm not exactly sure. And that was simply an artifact of the stats to support that. So how much money can you make if this thing continues to work for you versus how much can you lose if things like today happen? And there was so much asymmetry in that. We just, you know, as things get whittled down, we just take that trade off. We take it off as a function of the asymmetry in the trade. And do we know where it's going to go? No. Like in 2017, we had it on and we took it off too early again. So, you know, in the fall of 2017, that would have continued to work. We took it off late summer 2017. And that was kind of the same um, idea right now, which is when something is in the zeroth percentile and is lower than it's ever been, what is the pro rata chance? That's just going to continue to grind low. It can happen, but we just we elected to take it off. And I'm right. glad and we that, did. And that trade is, let's say, instead of the S&P 500, it was the S&P 2. It's just Apple and Microsoft. You'd be selling volatility in the S&P 2 and be buying volatility in Apple and Microsoft. And the way that makes money is if uh, Apple and Microsoft are not correlated. So Apple goes up a ton, but Microsoft goes down a ton. And that way, the index volatility uh Will, will, will realize less than the constituents of the volatility. And so when you said it was in a zeroth percentile, I think you mean that the uh, implied volatility in the index was so cheap relative to the constituents that it was implying that stocks would continue to not be correlated. Oh, NVIDIA is going down, but JP Morgan is roaring. So there's a, there's a lot to fill the gap. And you're saying that that was too expensive uh, and it was in its zeroth percentile. I don't expect you have the number now, but what percentile is it in right now? Um, percentile, depending on your percentile window, but here's, here's an interesting little market artifact. If you look at the core three M or core one M, which is the SIBO listed version of this trade, uh, it's wildly off from our internal calculations. I'm not even exactly sure what the SIBO is doing today or how they're calculating it. We don't use their calculation, so I'm not going to say it should be the same because it isn't the same, but, um, it's never as far off today. It's so much more far off today than it's ever been. We're talking like, you know, thousands and thousands of basis points. But going back to what you said, say you had the, um, you know, the S&P 2. Think about this intuitively. If you sell the S&P 2 straddle for whatever, and then you buy Apple and Microsoft, and Apple goes up 50%, Microsoft goes down 50%, the index is literally unchanged. Each stock has gone absolutely crazy. So if you're long volatility in Apple, great. If you're long volatility in Microsoft, great, because both of those are going nuts. And your net net index between the two is going nowhere. So your volatility in your index, collapses into zero, you make all the money possible on that trade. 
and the volatility within your constituents, which is Apple, Microsoft, both of those goes up dramatically and you're able to hedge out that risk as well. So you make, mo you make money thrice on the index, on each individual name and collectively. So what I'm saying is that that similar opportunity because of things like NVIDIA, NVIDIA has gone bonkers or the Magnificent Seven, whatever, has gone bonkers. So those trades have really just lowered the correlation. Then if you look at really everything in the marketplace just kind of has a mind of its own until last week and until today. And you said green button or red button. So you're shorting volatility and are you long the index? So can we infer from that, that, you know, in a risk balance way, you think that this uh, very short duration crash, you know, if it continues, it will be a crash capital C uh, is it's, it's days are numbered and, and you think there will be a rebound. So there's two answers to that question over what time period is, is the qualifier. Um, we are along the index. We're not going to be along the index by the end of the day. I'm not going to carry that risk overnight. We are doing that opportunistically. I'm not recommending being along the market. We are not along the market. We're not, we are, but we're not going to be, if that's what I'm saying. If you're not um, going to be in two and a half hours when the market closes. Correct. Correct. So this is like a, you know, a day trading opportunistic type situation relative to, you know, do I think the market goes up between now and next Friday? I have no idea any more than anybody else. I will say unequivocally that the vol metrics that we look at say that you should not be in a risk on posture at this point, nor have they been in that way for you know over a week now. So you could have argued easily that a week ago, you know, we could have had this conversation and you know I would have told you to be risk off and I will continue to be risk off until things get back to where they should be risk on. And what volatility metrics are you looking at that indicate people should not, or folks should not, not be in a risk on uh, posture. And I'll say that the twice you've been on this program, they both were in 2022. And even though that was a sell-off, both times you, uh, the, you, I had you on at a time like today, although probably less extreme than today, where the market was selling off, the VIX was very high. And you said, actually, a market crash is unlikely. It can continue to drift downwards. But you know, a 2008 moment is unlikely. And uh, you were right. We did have a renewed sell-off in October, uh, but there was no you know, the VIX did not go as high even as it did, you know, even today. Um, so you've been right twice on that, uh, that it wasn't the time to panic, uh, at least in the volatility space. Delta is a different story. But what what are you seeing today that says you should not be in a risk on posture? So there's the concept of price and there's the concept of velocity of price. And those two things, while related, are not the same. If you have a, a $1 million house and you put it on the marketplace and you, you lower it to 990, 980, 970, 960, yeah, okay, fine, you're not getting your price, but you don't know what the true price is. The difference is, is that if you have to sell your million dollar house and you're selling it today and it was on the on the market last week for a million dollars, now it's 700 grand, 400 grand, 200 grand. Um, those are wildly different you know, marketplaces. The velocity of the second example is so much more swift. Um, so when you're looking at the volatility and the, the reach for it, how fast and how hard and what prices are people willing to pay? That to me is much more instructive than market go up, market go down, because market go up, it could go up 50 bips tomorrow or down 50 bips tomorrow. And I get zero information from that. But if people are bidding the VIX up to 65 because the Nikkei is down 12 percent, that to me is a very different picture. Um, so what I'm saying is that when people are forced to make decisions, there's opportunity there that when they're not forced to make decisions, contrast that to 2022 when the housing market was going from, you know, million to 990 to 980 to 970, um, there was really nothing in that marketplace that says that it's going to go to 500, right? That's just too fast, too much, too too swiftly. Conversely, um, we're right now have a bearish slant as well, but the velocity of that slant is just much more uh, ascendant. Got it. So because volatility is so high, you say cut it velocity, but let's say it's just volatility for stocks. Because volatility is so high, that is making you bearish. And it is it because implied volatility is so high, what people are paying, or because realized volatility is so high, or both? Well, it's, it's definitely all three. Um, and also the ratio of realized to, to, um, to implied. So if somebody is, if the marketplace is implying a price, and you are able to exceed that price by buying volatility, that means the market makers sold it for, to you too cheaply. And that sucks for them. So what they're going to do is raise the prices even higher like using GameStop as an analogy, you know, GameStop was ripping up. Everybody knows that. And market makers raised their vault to like 300. Turns out 300, which is an absurdly large number 
was still way too cheap. So they raised it to a thousand. Actually, I think they raised it to 1200, but my model only goes to a thousand. So mm. <laughs> like some, my, all my knowledge of the marketplace stops at a thousand for some reason, um, which, cause it's such an absurd number, right? It's like, you know, a house that's worth a million dollars trading for four cents. It's just like, all right, well, at some point it doesn't even make sense. Um, but my point is, is that when the implied vol is still too cheap, which it is right now, um, that there's no reason that you would not want to own that volatility because it's paying you really to own it. So if you can go out and buy a bunch of straddles, go to sleep every day and wake up with more money than you had yesterday, that's a great trade. And the market makers know that. So what they'll do is they'll try to figure out where they can raise their volatility so that they make money, not hand it to you. Hello, everyone. Permissionless 3 is coming to Salt Lake City on October 9th. The event for crypto natives is heading west, and we are bringing the biggest names in crypto together for an insane, can't miss event. Hear from more than 200 industry titans, including Balaji, Mike Novogratz, and Dan Tapiero. The conversations at Permissionless will be covering the hottest themes in crypto, including modularity, restaking, the Bitcoin and Solana ecosystems, AI and crypto, rollups and L2s, institutional adoption, and of course, the November election that will be right around the corner. We couldn't be more excited about this event. Get your ticket today and make sure I get some bragging rights by using my code FG10 to get 10% off. That's FG10, stands for Ford Guidance. I want to see you there, do it. It's going to be at one of the most beautiful places in the United States, and everyone's going to be there. Van Spencer's going to be there. Jim Bianco's going to be there. Jan Van Eck's going to be there. So what are you waiting for? Get your tickets now by clicking the link in the description and use code FG10. Back to the episode. And what levels of volatility are cheap right now? You said it, it pays to be long volatility. As long as as long as the market st- continues to crash, the stock market. But but what if the, if the market stops crashing? Uh, being long volatility is going to hurt really bad. Right? Yeah, that's why the futures are you know twenty five and the, the VIX is it was sixty five. So that's exactly right. So I mean you know going back to your UVXY or VXX analogy, you know if you look at a chart of these things, they started at a trillion, they go down to zero. Yeah, everybody knows that. So with that, they price it so that it is projected tomorrow, next Wednesday, three Wednesdays from now to be roughly on a linear regression of that line. So everyone t- trades that same stuff. So if you think you're going to outsmart that market maker, you have to trade an exceedance of that. You have to be more right than they were, which is totally possible. People do it every day, but you have to have a reason. And sometimes that reason is luck. Sometimes that reason, but you have the same data that everybody else has. So the idea that you're going to look at that same data and just like outsmart Cisco Hana on this, good luck. It's just not going to work. So you got to get something a little bit more nuanced or clever than that. Yeah, you have a chance and your uh, your edge is experience, but Susquehanna also is experience, but also you're smaller, more nimble. Mm-hmm. But I think the average person watching and myself definitely does not have an edge. And, uh, you know, if, if they succeed, it will be because of luck. Well, you know, the, but the retail traders do have a unique edge in that they're not market makers. So market makers make money most of the time, but every now and then they get caught flat footed as well. So if you're a market maker on Friday um, in SPY straddles, right, you sold a bunch of SPY straddles because it was bid. And that means people were net net buying it. So those people that are net net buying it on Friday had an opportunity to buy something for something that paid them today, Monday. And those the market makers that sold them those straddles lost money. Now tomorrow's going to be a new day, but you have a unique opportunity in that you don't have to walk into tomorrow with the same position. You can change it up every day and you're not compelled to be in the marketplace. So what I mean is you can kind of pick your spots and those spots can sometimes be a superior trade. And so the fact that you're less bullish uh, or more bearish than in, you were in 2022 is because volatility is higher? It is about the rate of change of the rate of change more so than the absolute level. Because a VIX of 30 in 2022 has a very different feel to it than a VIX of 30 today. Uh, so um, it's, it's the volatility of the volatility. The fact that the VIX went from... 12 to uh or it went from 18 to 30 so quickly or from 18 to 64 so quickly that is what freaks you out or your rational analysis is that it's freaking out other people the volatility yeah. 65 is a crazy number 65 is war number 65 is you know a global pandemic where they shut down the global e- economy for an unknown period of time two weeks to flatten the curve or whatever or you know a gfc where the you know the entire global banking system is, you know, one day away from collapse. 65 is an absurdly large number. So that's what I'm saying. You know, if you don't want to sell 65 on a bad jobs number and, you know, Japan carry trade unwind, you know, to me, like, why wouldn't you want to sell that? 
unless you think it's going to unwind even more over the next few weeks when you're going to recession. But even a recession, you know, you don't get a 65 VIX in a recession. Uh, so could you? So it's impossible to sell the VIX at 65. But could you sell instruments that the VIX is measuring, like when the VIX let's uh, peaked at 65, it was pre-market. Um, could you have sold those uh, 30 day options on the S and P 500? You could have sold if you're a cowboy VIX calls very, very high and they would have made money for sure. The idea that, um, you know, the, the put spreads, which is something I would typically look at, you know, they're so wide. So as to this is, this is true. So I was looking at, um, you know, we have, I told you we had this, um, you know, Jan call spread on and, and VIX, right? So we, we paid money to put it on and the market was so inverted. We had to pay money to take it off. So if you pay money to buy a pair of shoes, if someone is going to buy your shoes from you, you would expect to collect money. No, you buy shoes for 50 bucks and you pay 60 bucks to get out of your shoes. <laughs> you know, it, it's that, that's how inverted the market was. So, so the, saying, VIX, the, the Jan VIX actually went down in value? The VIX options were so wide so as to make oh. a market that is so ridiculously inverted so that you have to pay money to get out of something that you already own. But that wasn't the real, that, you know, the, who knows what the market was trading there, but the bid offer is so large. Like, in other words, if you see an option that is 25 cent bid at $4, what do you do with that? That's a very big number. You know, is fair value right in the middle? Of course not. The fair value is going to be the future volatility of that projected instrument. So this is... This is the answer to the question that you you were asking, which is if vol is going to go down, what do I hedge on? What do I buy? How do I take action on this? Well, that's the hard part because what you have to be able to do is accurately predict forward volatility. And it's not just going to be time one minus time two over, over the, the difference. It is going to be a projection that is based in math and some luck because you don't know what volatility is going to be like tomorrow or tomorrow Wednesday. Um, it's going to be that, but say that is the correct hedge number or the correct volatility assumption. And since nobody knows that, including the people that make a market in that product, all you can really do is speculate where you think ball is going to go. And where do you think ball is going to go? I think it's going to go lower. Lower, but you're, so you're, you're bearish on volatility, but you're also not that bullish or even bearish on the market. So the, tr the trade would be short volatility and short the market. I'm different in the sense that I have vol going into today. So it is very easy for me to, to like talk trash and to sell vol because I have it. Yes. But if, if you don't have it, the idea that you're going to buy it today, I think is a terrible trade. Um, if I had to do anything, I would probably sell volatility in a, in a risk defined manner or something like that. Like a really wide condor um, is something I would take a look at, but I would not be buy, buying any volatility today. No, I am selling volatility today. You are selling volatility today. I actually did sell a little bit of volatility uh, a few hours ago in a, in a riskified manner. So, you know, when I hear experts such as yourself say that, I, I'm uh, feeling good about myself. And I, I definitely need to feel good about myself today because it was a brutal market, like I imagine it was for uh, most people watching this. One, one thing I should say to qualify some of these comments is we're making money today. But if the market was just down a little bit, you know, it wouldn't necessarily be like that. You know, we're making money because we're getting a large violent move in something that we're wrong. So say the market was, you know, down a little bit and whatever else, our VIX would not be carrying the day for us. So I don't want to just talk out of both sides of my mouth. Like we always make money when volatility goes up. That's not true. Yeah. We have to make money when volatility goes up a lot. But if vol goes up a little bit, then that might not do anything for us. And uh, I get the, um, so you think volatility will go down, uh, but isn't volatility going down generally uh accords with the stock market going up? Yes, generally. Um, also, something else to consider is the effects of Vanna and Charm. As volatility goes up, what happens is the delta of those options change. So if you have a 30 delta put, per se, and uh, volatility is 10, and then volatility goes to 50, well, the delta of your put changes. Not just the, the fixed rate put, but I'm seeing the absolute vol vol value of that volatility and the delta. So as a consequence of time and volatility, as time marches on, charm will kick in and the vol will diminish <clears throat> and the delta will diminish. In the same time, if vol diminishes onto itself and the vega component comes in, the delta will also change. So that's why I said something like a, um, a risk-defined condor. Risk-defined because you don't want to blow out, 
but you want to sell some vol without blowing out. So candidates for something like that would be like an iron condor. Got it. And so, you know, you did uh, do the thing, Noel, that, you know, every podcaster wants, every, wants people to do is you said that, oh, I, I'm, I'm cautious here. I'm not bullish on the market. But I just want to understand if you think implied volatility will go down, why are you not <laughs> bullish on the market? Why are you not, you know, bullish on the S&P 500? If, oh, I, told, <clears throat> I told you on the outside, I bought some deltas today. So, yeah. but, but mean, you're I selling have. them at 359. So my question is why? Because the overnight risk is so large, especially in so, insofar as it's in Asia and a theme narrative right now, is I'm not willing to overnight that delta. I'll take my chances. Now, if the market rips up 3% overnight, I wish I'd, I'd carry them. But I am in the business of you know, risk mitigation and trying to make money within a um, likely percentage. Anybody can get lucky, right? Um, mm -hmm. you, know, you can pull an ace of spades out of the deck, but there's only you know, one in 52 chance that's going to happen. Um, but you know, now that you have an ace, you know there's only three more aces. So that's a different trade, right? You know, if you told, if you pulled out three aces, the chance of you getting the last ace is a lot less than it was the first time around. My point is, is that it's much more profitable long term to play probabilities than it is to play luck. Got it. And yes, volatility is the friend of the long term investor because it allows them to get in at attractive points. It is the enemy of leverage. Most leverage speculators, uh, who especially who are on the long side, I say it is also the friend the friend of the handful of experienced uh, and veteran and very skilled volatility traders uh, such as yourself. So it's a, it is, it is a rough day. Noel, do you have any thoughts just on uh, the, the cause of this yen uh, carry trade unwinding? Again, who knows what the cause is, but people were short a very, uh, a currency that had depreciated a lot and interest rates were very low. The, I believe the Bank of Japan raised interest rates by 15 basis points from 10 to 25 basis points. So basically, so such a small uh, uh, raise, and it really just sparked all all of this uh, chaos. Uh, in your experience, uh, do you think you know what is what does your gut tell you about whether this will continue? I think you hit the nail on the head with the BOJ raising rates and, and being more bullish on rates. And if you look at the the yen and you know, the Nikkei, the Topex, whatever. Um, and it is the confluence of all these things. It wasn't, it's never just one thing, right? You might have people, by the way, volatility helps the market go up too. And it's one, it's one thing I want to say, you know, if you're a long spy and there's a bunch of vol guys keep buying vol and they never make money, well, they keep chasing it. So if spy keeps going up. But um, the, the confluence of these things that, you know, the Venn diagram intersection is where I, I feel like the trade ends up being because it's never just some guy over you know, in Botswana is blowing out and has to cover his hedge fund. It's never, because nobody's ever that big where they're gonna move the market this much. Or is it just the BOJ? Or is it just the fact that they think that Powell is now behind the curve? Your guess is as good as mine. Um, but because of there is no one thing means it could persist. But because any one of those one things isn't that big of a deal relative to how much ball is performing right now, I say fade it. You say fade. Well, Noel, uh, we'll let you get back to trading. Thanks so much for coming on and sharing your insights and uh, doing this impromptu emergency interview. Uh, people can find you on Twitter at Noel Convex and just remind uh, uh, our, our listeners where you do business, uh, your market maker, as well as your prop, prop fund. Convex AM is our website, C-O-N-V-E-X-A-M, like Convex Asset Management is the website, or reach out to me on Twitter. There we go. And a reminder for our, our viewers that all of the interviews, I, I'm on vacation for, for two weeks. So all of our interviews uh, were recorded before the sell-off. So, but they are uh, very valuable, in, you know, evergreen interviews that, that have value. So they definitely are, are not stale, uh, but just a heads up for our viewers. Uh, some very interesting interviews. Noel, thanks again. And thanks everyone for listening. Thanks, Jack. Thanks for watching. Remember to check out vanek.com slash motefg to learn more about the Vanek Morningstar Wide Moat ETF, ticker MOAT. Lastly, Forward Guidance is available not just on YouTube, but on all podcast apps. And a video version is available on Spotify and Twitter, where I post interviews regularly. Thanks again. Until next time.